Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Open Science Conference 2023, also celebrating its 10th anniversary. Yeah, I hope you all had a good lunch break, and if you're viewing in other parts of the world, a good evening break or a good morning break. Um, we are back and ready for part two of our keynote sessions today on day two of the Open Science Conference. Uh, let me first see if our next guest is here with us. That would be Miss Louise Bezuidenu. Um, Louise, are you there? Us. Hello, Louise. Can you hear us okay? Yes, I can hear you fine. Thank you. F fantastic. on identifying ways to improve the inclusion of low and middle income country researchers into the open science, uh, open science landscape. She holds PhDs in cardiothoracic surgery from the University of Cape Town, South Africa, and sociology from the University of Exeter in the United Kingdom. Louise currently holds, uh, works for the Data Archiving and Network Services, also known as the DANS, at the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Science, as a senior research data expert. Her current work relates to the evolution of the European Open Science Cloud, also known as the EOSC, and involves working with multi-partner consortia to develop EOSC training and responsible research materials. Her talk today will be representation and inclusion in open science, working towards a global digital commons. So Luis, welcome, and the digital floor is now yours. Well, thank you so much for the kind introduction. It's a real pleasure to be here and uh, very exciting to be speaking about uh, something which is very close to my heart, which is issues to do with representation and inclusion in open science. Uh, so I'm going to spend a few minutes setting the scene before I get on to the bulk of my uh, presentation. So as I'm sure everyone in the digital room will agree um, that the open science and the open research landscape is evolving very rapidly. And what we're seeing uh, through this evolution are um, incredible seismic changes in new ways of doing research, in new technological, disciplinary and social interconnectedness, and new ways of framing responsibility, transparency and reproducibility. Of course, while we recognize that things are changing very rapidly, we also do recognize that there are challenges affecting the evolution of the open science landscape. And these include the cost of um, building new infrastructures and in embedding open science in research infrastructures. Uh, community concerns uh, mainly to do with issues to do with uh, ownership and uh, scooping of data. Uh, there is already fragmented policy and the need for alignment of legislation, values and practices. And we also have to tackle existing monopolies, particularly in the publishing world, and the lack of willingness to change the status quo. But regardless of these challenges, um, openness and open science is widely recognized to be not only the right thing to do, but also the right way to be as researchers. Now, of course, uh, open science as a movement uh, relies very heavily on infrastructure and tools to support open workflow. Uh, there has been considerable public and private investment in open science supporting technologies, including uh, the development of digital tools, um, the development and expansion of repositories, and the development of open workflows. We've also in the last five years seen the evolution of the FAIR data standards, so findable, accessible, and interoperable and reusable data standards that are improving data movement through the landscape. So this is all very exciting, and it is increasingly becoming um, much easier to be open as a researcher in our daily work practices. However, what I'd like to suggest is that this enthusiasm for open science and this rapid evolution of open science infrastructures can sometimes mask key problems that we as an open science community need to deal with. Uh, I'd like to suggest that the focus on the desired future, so the digital commons that we all believe so strongly in, uh, can sometimes decrease our critical scrutiny about what is being built and how it is being built. Uh, it's also important to recognize that the open science uh, infrastructure and landscape is a mixture of public and private investment. And this can sometimes cause priority priorities to be mixed because public uh, open science tools, um, for example, 
are obviously um, beholden to their investors and their um, their profit margins, and and this sometimes can stand at tension to um, the the commu community led uh, open science tools, which uh, take very strongly the values of inclusion and equity uh, from open science at heart. It's also possible that the enthusiasm, our enthusiasm for the speed of transformation, um, and also the the fact that a lot of open science infrastructure is funded by uh, time limited projects, can mean that compromises are made. That we need to find the solution that is the best for the time we have available rather than the best solution in the long term. And um, what I like to th think of as the producer online versus online user aspect of data is problematic. And what I mean by this is that there is an unequal amount of attention being placed on moving data from the site of production to the online environment uh, in contrast to the amount of information, uh, the amount of attention being placed on the movement of data from the online environment to the end users. And this inequity is something I'm going to be talking about more uh, in the later slides. What these concerns and these problems uh, really force us to question is whether the current open science landscape is actually equally open to everyone. Is it living up to our ideals of openness, inclusion, and equity, or are there still things that we need to think about? One of the reasons I'd like to propose that we have this tension, that we are overlooking these prob problems of um, openness, is that much of open science discourse and much of open science development has happened in a small number of high-income countries. And these high-income countries um, have researchers who are engaging in open science practices, but are supported by uh, funding models, by government buy-in, by policies, and by uh, broader um, information and communication technologies. And this gives us a very specific perspective of how users interact with open science infrastructures. And what I think is important is that we need to actually shift our focus from the centrist idea of open science users to a research that is what I like to call outside of the center. And if you look at research outside of the center, it becomes very apparent that there are a number of different challenges that put tension on, the, on this idea that open resources are open for everyone. The first is that there are different tech, differing technical systems with it, uh, within research environments outside of this, the center. Um, researchers working in low and middle income countries have very different access to technologies. This has impacts on the way that they create data. It also has impacts on the way that they share data, which can mean that they are sometimes not able to engage with open science infrastructures in the same way as their colleagues in the center. Uh, we're, what we're also seeing, what became very apparent during COVID, is that some open science tools are actually blocked to users uh, in different countries. Um, the image on the right uh, shows the response message for um, access requests from Iran uh, to GitHub. So we are seeing um, instances of geo-blocking within the open science landscape. Because of the mix of commercial and, um, and community uh, tools within the open science landscape, we're seeing the evolution of freemium models and membership fees that are accompanying access to some tools. Um, this can be extremely problematic for researchers who are in financially unstable countries who are unable to pay for um, the, the membership fees or the, um, the higher uh, models of, of access that would enable them to actually use the full suite of tools uh, that are available to their colleagues in um, high income countries. And finally, uh, despite our enthusiasm for moving things online, and this is definitely not even a criticism of this conference, uh, what we are seeing is an over-reliance on um, online engagement and online uh, access as a way of facilitating community engagement and open science uh, collaboration. And what we tend to forget is that uh, the cost of data and the bandwidth speed varies considerably around the world. Um, this is a, a study that was done recently on the cost of, um, of data in different countries. And you'll see that in Malawi, for instance, um, one gigabyte of data costs 27 US dollars. And if you're expecting uh, researchers in those countries to, um, to be engaging uh, profitably online, uh, we have to recognize that this comes with extreme uh, financial implications. So, um, Recognizing the problems 
inherent within the open science infrastructures and recognizing how different research looks outside of the center. And um, we really need to start asking the question, can all users equally engage with the open science landscape when they have an internet connection? Uh, if we're moving beyond our normal thinking about the digital divide, as in online, offline, if we're thinking about researchers who are online, just in different research settings, are they able to equally access open science resources? So this raises the question about what do we actually know about the limits of openness or the potential gaps in access um, within the open science landscape. Um, what we have seen is that previous studies have relied on research impact surveys and desktop research. Um, I know my colleague Joe Heverman is going to follow me with a talk that we did a desktop research study on open science tools. Um, and uh, from these studies, while it is important to recognize that there are definitely variations and problems within the open science landscape, it is actually difficult to understand the breadth and depth of the problem. Um, we require quantitative data, not only to understand the exact specificities of the problem, but also to track its dynamic change through time, because obviously these issues of openness uh, will expand and contract depending on the socio-political uh, situations of the countries and, and also um, provisions uh, in uh, national and regional infrastructures. So recognizing the fact that we needed uh, more information on this topic, uh, my collaborator Hugh Shanahan and I uh, posed the question, are trusted digital repositories listed on th RE3 data, as well as other digital open science tools, uh, equally accessible to researchers around the world? Um, we're not making any value judgments about this. We just wanted to know, are they equally accessible? Can we actually, as an open science community, pride ourselves on the fact that uh, we are achieving our goals of making uh, research data and research resources equally available to researchers and users around the world, um, free from any sort of uh, financial or other barriers? So what we did was the following. Um, we decided to, um, to construct a computational methodology uh, that would test access to a list of uh, resources that we collated. Uh, these resources, as I mentioned, was not only the list of uh, trustworthy repositories on RE3 data, but also uh, lists of um, digital open science tools that uh, Joe Haverman and I had developed in our previous studies that were built on um, a number of other lists uh, that, that, that were available. So we had 2,781 uh, sites to analyze. Um, what we decided to do was to uh, use VPNs or virtual private networks uh, to provide uh, proxies for 14 countries or territories. Uh, we decided on a range of different countries, some of whom had political uh, problems at the moment, some of whom were recognized to have um, bandwidth issues and, and uh, infrastructural issues, and some that were high income countries um, that were well represented within the open science community. So we decided on Cuba, Iran, Iraq, North Korea, Sudan, Syria, Venezuela, uh, Yemen, Burma, Ireland, UK, Japan, South Africa, and the USA. And uh, the, the program that we wrote uh, worked in the following way. So it identified the URL of um, the open resource uh, and then ran the access request through a proxy, through the VPN for um, the specific countries that we were looking at um, made an access request from that country to the resource and then sent back the um, the response code to us. And we were able to log uh, the likelihood of getting access to the site uh, when one was based in these different countries. So uh, basically asking what happens when we try to access all the URLs we collected uh, from these different countries. And the data we were recording were um, basically status codes. And um, so whether or not we were getting a return from the red website, we were recording error messages. Um, so if access request was not um, completed uh, and also if um, if it was successful, so HTML, if um, the access request was, was successful. Uh, what we didn't do was at, um, record the differences in HTML because sometimes you will get an access request returned um, but it will be at a lower quality. So we weren't act, we weren't analyzing that type of data. We were basically just analyzing, can someone access the specific website um, from a specific country uh, when, when one makes a request? 
So the first thing we were looking at were error codes. So these were um, when the access request was not completed. Uh, this uh, can be in the case where um, the website returns an error because it's timed out, because the bandwidth is insufficient, or because it's blocked, so it just hangs and um, the researchers aren't able to access the site. Um, we did recognize uh, when returning when when analyzing error codes that some websites are just not responsive. So some of the uh, the websites in our list were perhaps obsolete. So um, the counting of unresponsive websites was not particularly useful. So what we decided to do when we were analyzing our data was to compare the number of timeouts um, for websites in contrast to the number of successful responses from the USA. So what we are doing is seeing how many more times it is likely for a researcher based in one of the countries we were looking at to get an error code for an access request in comparison to their colleagues in the USA. And this graph shows uh, what we were seeing. Um, what you'll see is that uh, access to um, web the websites we were looking at uh, varies considerably around the world. Uh, countries like Sudan have over five times higher likelihood of not being able to access websites due to an error code uh, than their colleagues in the USA. Similarly, for Syria and Cuba, um, access is extremely problematic. And these are all open resources. So one would expect in an ideal world for everything to be at one, uh, so it's equal to um, the USA's access. What we were also looking at were specific instances of access um, error codes. Um, so what we call 403 codes. 403 codes are returned when access is explicitly denied uh, to a client, um, which is a, a reflection of what we call geo-blocking, where um, the website has been set up to explicitly reject any requests coming from uh, different countries. Um, the 403 code uh, is compared to the USA, so 200 is a normal status code, and we were looking at whether certain countries were actually being explicitly blocked from open resources uh, based on uh, intentional geo-blocking. And what we saw was that um, some, there were some instances around the world, but Syria, for instance, had a very high number of uh, websites returning 403 codes, which meant that researchers in Syria were being explicitly blocked uh, from open resources. So what can we learn from this study? Um, unfortunately, what the study definitely demonstrates is that openness of open science resources is not equally enjoyed around the world. And assuming that open science infrastructures and tools provide a level playing field for researchers around the world is extremely problematic. It becomes very apparent from this that it's not just a case of funding or the digital divide. Um, it's not simply a case that researchers have insufficient uh, information and communication technologies that can be solved by targeted investments. Um, instead, it is obvious that financial sanctions, national and regional broadband provisions, research funding, and also the design of the open science infrastructures all play a role in how researchers are able to access, engage, and utilize uh, open science resources online. It's also becoming apparent that the current discussions about the evolution of the open science landscape um, and uh, current discussions about inclusion really lack the depth to address these problems. Um, because we are still talking in terms of the digital divide, these latent framings of catching up, so once you have the sufficient ICT uh, and computing power, uh, distort opportunities to build open science infrastructures that present equal opportunities to researchers at the current moment. Um, we can't keep waiting for, for everything to, to be worked out in the future. What we're seeing uh, from our study and from related studies is that at the moment, the open science landscape is unequal, and we need to do something about that. But we're also seeing from the 403 returns is that the inclusion of politics as a mediating factor of openness means that issues of access are continually changing because uh, financial sanctions and geopolitical tensions um, change very rapidly around the world. And this can rapidly change uh, researchers' access to seemingly open uh, resources. And we see that, unfortunately, um, with the current situation in, in Russia and, and definitely with other situations around the world. What became apparent from um, not only this study, but also the desktop study that I mentioned earlier, is that um, there's a lot of confusion as to how uh, open resources um, need to transact with countries that have um, geopolitical problems. And that uh, variability in open science funding 
introduces um, individualism in decisions about responsibility. So because there is a lack of consistent and coherent decision making around these issues from the open science community, uh, we are seeing um, issues of self-initiated sanctions, so um, being risk adverse and refusing to transact. We're seeing variabilities in definitions about users and transact, so some uh, some open science resources are following the spirit of the law, not the letter of the law. And we're seeing that personal positions and commitments can lead to un inconsistent responses, obviously, by introducing a level of personal decision making in um, decisions about access to open science tools, we can introduce as, um, biases. And finally, um, what we're seeing is that there's a potential need to expand discussions around key standards such as fair and care. We can't rely on the fair and care principles to solve these issues. Um, but what we're also seeing is that um, perhaps there is a potential need to expand these principles even further. Um, the accessibility elements in uh, FAIR, so the A in FAIR, focus unequally on the first half of, data of the data journey, as I said, from the point of production to the online environment, in contrast to the second, so the online environment to the user, and potentially there is a need to actually scrutinize this in more detail. Um, what is potentially even more concerning is that um, the political implications of sanctions could cause Caroline data to become inaccessible to certain communities. So the care principles, for those of you who are unfamiliar, um, specifically govern um, management of indigenous knowledge. But if we're seeing um, indigenous knowledge um, housed in repositories or digital open science tools that are subject to the variabilities of geopolitical influences, it is possible that indigenous communities might at some point not be able to access um, the data that they should have sovereign rights to. So where to from here? Um, we feel very strongly that uh, the code that we've written um, is a first in a, a longer step um, that for, for monitoring um, limits of openness within the open science landscape and within open science infrastructures. And what we are aiming to do and what we are, are currently in discussion about is uh, building an observatory, an online observatory for monitoring, for dynamic monitoring of these. And this would provide information not only about changes in um, accessibility, uh, but also allow uh, repositories and other digital open science tools to, uh, to self-check themselves to see um, whether they are meeting their um, obligations and expectations of equitable access. Uh, we hope that these data will foster critical discussions about the limits of openness and cause some sort of self-reflection within the open science community about um, whether we are actually putting our money where our mouth is, so to speak. And um, because we do need to scrutinize the design of emerging infrastructures and technologies, as well as the inclusion of commercial companies into the open science landscape. Um, because of um, these blockages within the open science landscape, we also would like to encourage discussions on resilience and redundancy as key to the design of openness. We should not allow a small number of digital open science tools to dominate um, the open science landscape, particularly when they might be subject to the vagaries of blocking or, or time outing. Um, and this requires us to really think about um, unpacking the ethics of openness. Are we talking about the greatest number of scientists, which would obviously sit in high income countries? Are we talking about the greatest number of people um, who should have access to open science resources? Um, and then we need to think about uh, issues to do with the ethics of marginalization. So how can we as uh, open science communities um, stick by our political convictions and our personal convictions without a uh, quote, without leaning into a mob mentality that, that causes massive disruptions in the open science landscape. So I'd like to thank you for your attention. I'd also like to thank uh, my collaborator, Hugh Shanahan from the Royal Holloway University of London uh, for his, um, his work on this, this project together. If you have any questions about the presentation or the upcoming observatory, please do feel free to contact me. My email is on the, um, on the screen. And uh, please do feel free to access the, the paper that Hugh and I wrote about uh, this study uh, to get a bit more detail about it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Louise. Yeah, a really fascinating subject, a great presentation. To our audience around the world, we have again our QR code if you'd like to ask some questions directly. Um, I had a quick question on researching about you. I actually saw that you participated, were active with a hackathon in South Africa. I believe it was in 2018, is that correct? 
Um, I think you're meaning lab hack. Uh, yeah, the lab hack. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So lab hack is an, a, a small event organization that I co-founded with some friends. Um, it is uh, specifically to encourage uh, early career researchers, particularly undergraduates in uh, resource scarce um, environments to build low cost versions of equipment that they wouldn't necessarily have the opportunity to um, to experience. So many of the undergraduates are, are learning life sciences in labs that don't have PCR machines or magnetic yeah. stirrers or centrifuges. So we uh, we encourage them to build low cost versions of the equipment to get a deeper understanding of um, of the equipment and a bit more creative problem solving in low resource settings. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I thought it was a great, a fantastic program, and I wanted you to share it with uh, our audience. Sure. Yes, and we do have a question coming in now, so if we can go. Why and where would you include commercial companies in the OS processes? So there are a number of um, commercial companies that are really embedded within um, the open science landscape. For instance, um, GitHub is a very good example. Um, there's nothing necessarily wrong with having open uh, commercial companies including included in open science processes, particularly when, like GitHub, they are very committed to the open science um, movement. Uh, one of the problems, though, with having commercial companies, and particularly those based in the USA, is that they are subject to the same financial legislation as any commercial company. And in that, re in that way, they are subject to the same financial um, sanctions as any other company, mm. which causes the issues that I, I'd raised in the earlier slides that GitHub uh, is blocked for users in countries that the US holds sanctions against. And it's because of those issues, rather than the fact that they are commercial and therefore, you know, at odds with the open science in, uh, ethos, uh, that is the re reason that they are actually slightly problematic. Um, so we just need to be a bit more aware of the restrictions that the commercial companies are working under and as a community try and find ways that we can support the commercial companies in making sure that they are able to support the open science ethos. Okay, thank you. And we have our next question coming in. Let me see here. We can brand in the next company. Can I, as a producer of OS resources, increase the accessibility of my resources in addition to publishing them in fair repositories? Um, definitely. I think there's always ways to uh, to increase the accessibility of your resources. I think, uh, as I mentioned, the observatory that we're hoping to build will definitely be a, a very useful tool for open science producers because you'll be able to check um, whether your resource is actually accessible to uh, researchers around the world. Um, but increasing the accessibility of your resources in more pragmatic ways uh, can be as simple as thinking about how you would access the same resource from a mobile phone, because a lot of users from low middle income countries would primarily be using their mobile phones to access resources. Um, can, do you have low bandwidth accessible versions? So um, do you have very heavy plugins in your, your website? Do you, do you have alternative options that can be used? Um, if you're having a conference or um, hosting a training, uh, can you provide the slides, the audio recording separately from mm -hmm. the video recording so that they're cheaper to download? Um, and still provide the same amount of information. There are lots of different ways that you can uh, start thinking about making your resources more accessible. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you for the great questions. And Luis, thank you for a very thought-provoking presentation today. A virtual round of applause, even though we're not in the same room. And we hope you enjoyed the rest of the Open Science Conference. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Take Bye care. now. Bye-bye.